At the end of one of our segments for Black History Month, we concluded by saying, wouldn't it be a good thing if we shone a light on black achievement, not just in February, but also throughout the rest of the year? Well, here goes. Tonight, we're going to talk about the first black Canadian ever to win a seat in any legislature in the country, and we're betting few of you have ever heard of him. Leonard Braithwaite got elected the MPP for Etobicoke in 1963. That's five years before Lincoln Alexander became the first black MP. Braithwaite died March 28, 2012. He served three terms at Queen's Park, and to learn more about his life and legacy, we welcome, in Chicago, Illinois, Warren Salmon. He's president of the Ontario Alliance of Black School Educators, and Len Braithwaite was his godfather. In the nation's capital, Michael Coteau, the MP for Don Valley East. In Brampton, Ontario, Gwyn Chapman, whom Braithwaite mentored back in the day. She's an anti-black racism advisor for the city of Brampton, communication specialist and motivational speaker. And in North York, Ontario, David Braithwaite, a teacher at George S. Henry Academy, and as you may have guessed, Len Braithwaite was his father. It's great to have you four on TVO tonight for a long overdue conversation about somebody who was a historic figure of great importance. Let's start with a little background, since as we suggested off the top, I suspect a lot of people have never heard of Len Braithwaite. So here we go, the graphic please, Sheldon. Leonard Braithwaite was born in Toronto in 1923 to a Barbadian father and Jamaican mother. He served overseas with the Royal Canadian Air Force during World War II. He had a BCom from the University of Toronto in 1950, an MBA from Harvard Business School in 52, his law degree at Osgoode Hall in 58, got elected two years later to be a school board trustee, then a town councillor from Etobicoke in 1962, became the MPP for Etobicoke from 63 to 75, and then made a political comeback as controller back in municipal government for the city of Etobicoke from 82 to 85. Now, Michael Coto, I'm going to start with you first because, frankly, you're the guy who called me a few weeks back and said, here's a guy no one's heard of and we ought to do a show on this. So, you get the first question here. And I'm going to take you back to 2011 when you were one of 12 people of color elected to the Ontario legislature, 12 out of 107. And I wonder what you imagine it would have been like for Len Braithwaite to walk into that legislature in 1963 not 12, but one, one out of 108. What do you think? You know, when I used to uh, walk the hallways of Queen's Park and you see these big murals of all these politicians and you see their pictures and, you know, Mr. Braithwaite always stood out for obvious reasons. There was uh, himself and uh, a woman by the name of Pritchard. She was the only woman, he was the only person of color. And I used to just stop every time I walked by that, those pictures and looked at his face and thought the same thing, you know, what was life like for him? And um, I couldn't tell you, uh, you know, because I didn't know him very well, what his life may have been like, but I could imagine. But I know, I always knew walking by there that I had a lot to, to thank him for, uh, for really not only breaking, you know, breaking the barriers of uh, politics in Ontario, but being the first black Canadian in this entire country um, that, you know, that really just uh, made it possible for someone like me to be elected. And, you know, I'm very grateful for him. And in 2012, I gave a tribute to him uh, in the Ontario legislature. And uh, since that point forward, I've just been researching his life more and more and really just recognizing his importance in Canadian politics. Just to be clear, you are drawing a line between his own election in 1963 and your election half a century later. You think you can make that direct connection? Well, well, well think about it. After him, who was the next person elected, uh, you know, who was black in Ontario? It was, uh, I think, in 85, it was Alvin Curling. Yeah, 20, you know, 20 years Alvin later. Curling, yeah, 20 years later. And Alvin Curling is the guy I go to for advice because there's not many people, you know, who are, you know, Caribbean background, African-Canadian that have walked that pathway. So, you know, uh, Alvin talks about Mr. Braithwaite uh, a lot, and uh, and uh, I feel like I have a connection to him, even though it was way back in the early 60s and I was elected in uh, in 2011. Okay, Gwyn, I gather he was a mentor of yours back in the day. Maybe you could tell us how that happened. Well, I've always been uh, very interested in, in service. I, I grew up uh, in St. Lucia um, with a father who told us that we have to be our brother's keeper. So, you know, we took that very, very seriously. And at the time I was looking for people who I feel could inspire 
um, can inspire the next generation of leaders. And, you know, I um, was at the time putting on a lot of sessions within the city schools, churches, city hall and, and Queens Park. And we were looking for our legends, our icons who've carried us, you know, to this time. We wanted to make sure that we acknowledge them and that we got all the lessons that we could from them. And so, we, you know, at the time I, I met Leonard Braithwaite, uh, Lincoln Alexander, um, the, the great Dr. Howard McCurdy, who was an incredible mentor of mine as well. And, you know, what I felt my responsibility was was to take these people's uh, lives and put them forward so that others can be inspired, they could learn from it and understand the value of civic engagement, of political involvement, of, hope, of voting. And so this is how I came across this wonderful man. And at uh, the end of the summer, 2020, they called it in Toronto at the time, the summer of the gum. I was looking for a way to inspire our community to remind them that we come from a legacy of greatness, not only going back to the beginning of time, but we have greatness right here in Canada, great leaders. And so he was part of, of um, a session that we had honoring the icons, the legends who have paved the way for us. And so this was my first initial meeting with him. And he was so gracious, always very positive and very um, willing to help in whatever way he could. So, you know, we go a long way. Um, you know, I could talk a little bit longer about, you know, his. Um, <laughs> well, that's OK. We're going to get we'll get everybody else yeah. in here as well. I yeah. just uh, Sheldon, I'm just going to ask our director, Sheldon Osman, picture number two, please, at the bottom of page two. Let's bring that up right now. Look at that. This is the first time a black man walked into the legislative assembly in the province of Ontario as an elected member of that assembly. This is back in 1963. And I want to bring Warren in at this point. Warren, you were his Godson, how did that happen? Well, actually, my father, the late uh, Dr. John Dunzel Salmon, uh, was born in the same year as Uncle Len. You know, they grew up together in Toronto and uh, downtown Toronto. You know, one of very few few black families, and you know, these were really uh, self-made men. I mean, they faced a lot of adversity growing up, but they both went on to do great, great things. And uh, you know, uh, so my dad, they were they were like best friends and. Uh, so uh, Uncle Len, I was fortunate that uh, he was my godfather. And uh, actually, I just came across some old 8 millimeter footage of uh, the, the christening when he became my godfather, uh, you know, in the, wow. the early 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I'll date myself. That's terrific. Now, you, you call him, even though he was your godfather, you called him Uncle Len. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Know, always Uncle Len. Uncle Len. And did you ever go down to Queen's Park and see him do his thing? Um, I think it went uh, maybe you know once or twice. You know, I was just so proud to see him sitting, uh, you know, in uh, the legislator and uh, you know, just uh, he was you know kind of stood out, but he uh, you know always was uh, you know very strong. He wasn't intimidated, and he was always uh, you know very humble and uh, you know very uh, you know level-headed and so. David, I've purposely left you for the end because I wanted you to hear what everybody else had to say first. Uh, but you're the guy here, of course, who didn't call him uncle. You got to call him dad. And I, I wonder at what point in your life did you come to understand that he wasn't like everybody else's dad, that he actually had this historic part in the story of our province? Well, you can appreciate uh, I was fairly young uh, when he got to the Ontario legislature. And we were talking uh, last week, Steve, about, uh, well, did you go down and what did you do and all this sort of stuff. And um, he used to take uh, my brother and I uh, down, uh, you know, a couple of times a year or whatever uh, to get our haircuts, you know, and I was, uh, that was a big deal to me, you know, you'd get a haircut and you'd have a free lunch and then uh, back to the house sort of thing. <laughs> but um, it, it, it really didn't, um, not so much hit me, but obviously later on in life, uh, when you when you when you take uh, your father to or your late father to all these different functions and he's getting all these awards and and this and that for for being the first uh, person to do this and, and and all that sort of stuff right so it wasn't really until probably uh, my late my late teens where it actually started to um, to sink in that uh, what he did was uh, was uh, not only special but uh, not only helped himself but helped the community and others around him. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have, David, the conversation with him which went something like, hey, Dad, what was it like being the only black face in that whole chamber? 
Well, the, the one, I mean, I had many conversations with my father. Usually it was before I went up to the cottage to go cut grass for 12 hours. But anyways, he, I can't count on one hand uh, him ever complaining about about uh, him being the only person. I don't know. Um, it, it took a lot of fortitude uh, to do that. And as I say, put your tail between your legs. And my dad, uh, that's what he did. But he had a purpose and um, he wasn't going to let anybody, um, so to speak, get, in, get into his way in terms of what he wanted to do um, in life and in politics and as a, as a father. Gotcha. So, um, he never, I, he never really complained. The only time, well, it wasn't so much a complaint. I think it was a second term uh, with the Liberals, and I used to go. I used to tag along, um, and he uh, canvassing with him. And um, we were at one uh, person's house, and the person said, uh, "Oh no, I'm a federal liberal. I'm not a provincial liberal." And that, my dad, to the day he passed on, he could never get over that. What do you mean? What was the issue there? Well, the issue was that he was uh, campaigning and the individual he was talking to, well, my dad was in provincial politics, but the, but the individual said, oh, no, I'm a federal liberal, not a provincial liberal. <laughs> Got he, it. He couldn't, he couldn't get, his, he couldn't get his, uh, his mind around that. But anyways, I but gotcha. as I said. He never, he never, with all the stuff that you read about, and I mean, you only read about what happened, what he did, but how he did it and, and what he had to do to, to get uh, to where he wanted to go, um, that he never complained about. But um, what makes, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, so to speak. And, and that's the way he was. He was just, uh, he's, he's just like any, anybody else that wanted to do his best for not only his family, but his, but for his community. Gotcha. Michael, let me get you back in here. You two actually had a great deal in common, and I'll put a couple of the things on the record here. You started your political career on the school board, and so did he. You got elected as a Liberal MPP at Queen's Park, and so did he. Your father was from Grenada. His father was from Barbados, two islands over in the Caribbean. How much, how much of an inspiration was Len Braithwaite throughout your time, both in school board and then later at Queen's Park? You know, um, I, um, I only got to start to, to know his story, um, you know, closer to my time in the legislature. Um, and, you know, uh, at the beginning, uh, Steve, you said, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, people out there that don't know who he is. And, and, you know, that's true. There are a lot of people who know who he is. But you know, uh, I was, for example, just two minutes ago, uh, two minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, coming out of a committee meeting, and uh, I said to another politician, do you know who uh, Leonard Braithwaite is? And he said, no. And I told him the story. He said, I thought Lincoln Alexander was the first parliamentarian. And I said, no, well, actually five years before. So when I started to learn more about his story and to research what he went through, and we're not talking about just a regular person here. You know, on paper, this is a guy who you know, sacrificed, you know, himself in World War II to go out there. He, you know, he's, he was a bencher uh, at the Upper Canada Law Society, you know, school board trustee, city councilor, you know, lawyer, Osgood Hall graduate. You just keep naming it, just doesn't stop. You know, this is an extraordinary individual. But out of all the stories I've read about him, you know, th how he got into um, the, the, I guess, the Air Force, um, by going down uh, week after week, month after, uh, he went down to Wellesley and Bay Street constantly and was rejected for a long time. I think it was over a year. He was constantly rejected. Then he bumps into a new recruiter. So the old guy got replaced, and it was a Ukrainian guy. Uh, and he says this. It was a Ukrainian guy who says, we've gone through the exact same thing in Western Canada. We were rejected from the army. And he stamped his paper, let him in. So this is a guy who just kept trying. And I think there's a beauty behind his story that he didn't let anyone define him. He defined himself and he kept going and his perseverance, his strength, that's that's what I draw from him. And uh, I hope I can be just even a, a small fraction of the man he was when it comes to accomplishment and uh, and really you know keep going and trying until you actually get the job done. And that's what makes him so amazing. Gwyn, it's interesting. You would think that the, the story of the first black man ever to be elected to Queens Park would be, as Michael Coteau just suggested, a much bigger deal and that more people would know about it. Um, 
you know, it's good that we know the story of Lincoln Alexander now or that more people know the story, but we need to know about Len Braithwaite as well. Why do you think uh, many fewer people know about his story? Well, well, the fact is um, we understand anti-black racism as it relates to Canada uh, society. And so the lack of seeing the value and the importance of all people, that's been an issue. So, you know, I, I, I always look forward, um, uh, Steve, and what we need to do now is to make a collective effort to teach, to promote, to share, to inform, and to educate Canada on the contributions, the dynamic and very important contributions of Black Canadians. And so we start with your program. Thank you very much. And I hope that we'll have more conversations to really um, uh, uh, show Canada the great contributions that Black Canadians have made from 1603, I believe, is when we were here. Hmm. Okay, well said. Warren, I want to talk about your mom, because I remember your yeah. mom. Uh, your mom, Bev Salmon, uh, was a member of uh, North York and then Metropolitan Toronto Council back in the day. I started off as a 20-something municipal affairs reporter and remember interviewing her all those years ago. Do you know how much Lynn Braithwaite was um, an inspiration to her in her own political career? Yeah, well, I guess, uh, you know, my parents started dating uh, in the mid-50s and, uh, you know, Lynn was... Uh, that's when she would have met Lynn and... You know, I know that uh, they were both actually in politics, uh, you know, at some point in time. So they would kind of, uh, you know, he would be there to really help support her and you know, bounce ideas off of her. And I think, you know, him being a trailblazer really helped uh, to, uh, you know, inspire her and inspire many others to, uh, you know, to seek and run for office. So, But he was always, you know, very, very supportive of, uh, you know, not just my mother, but, the, you know, the whole family. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, she made reference to him very often uh, during her political career. And uh, so it was nice that they had, uh, were connecting both, you know, on uh, the uh, political side and then, you know, having the family connections uh, that, uh, you know, David and I grew up together. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, along with his older brother and my late brother and the rest of the family. So we had, you know, that as a, a good base uh, you know, in terms of those connections and the connections just uh, even further on the political side. I should ask you, though, Warren, the same question I asked David, which is at what point in your life did you come to appreciate that your godfather was somebody very special? Right. Um, I mean, you know, the thing about Uncle Len, he was, he was always very humble. You know, he never talked about himself. And, uh, you know, just, uh, you know... He was just uh, just seeing what he had done. Uh, I think I recognized. You know, I was always very proud. Say, you know, my godfather was the first, you know, uh, black <laughs> Canadian elected, you know, in Canada. So I, I was very proud at a very young age, and aware of that. And uh, you know, just I was honored to be his godson. David, I wonder if that story that Michael Cotto just told about your dad being rejected for the armed forces numerous times before he was finally allowed in. Did you know that story? Well, we, uh, yeah, I did know that story. Um, and he, he told me uh, more than once about uh, him trying to uh, get into the, uh, to serve, to serve his country. And uh, multiple times, I don't know the exact number, but um, it was, I did mention uh, when we talked last week, it was a Ukrainian uh, recruiter. And, and that's the reason why uh, that recruiter um, accepted his application because uh, they had been, um, uh, for lack of a better word, not treated very well in Western Canada. So because of that uh, recruiter, my dad was able to to uh, join uh, the, armed, uh, the armed forces. Is there any question in your mind as to why he was rejected so many times before finally accepted? Well, I would, I would have to um, say because of his color. Understood. Michael, I, I gather, as I looked into his background as well, I gather he helped revoke a section of the Ontario Separate Schools Act that had allowed for racial segregation in publicly funded schools. And in fact, his maiden speech to the legislature, I gather, in February 1964, he talked about this. Now, again, when you were a school board trustee, did you know about his connection to that issue? 
No, I, I didn't know his connection to uh, that specific issue. And, uh, you know, I know, I think it was uh, Keith Davies when he was the Minister of Education, uh, worked with him to end segregation in Ontario schools. And uh, Mr. Brathwaite said that was his greatest accomplishment, I think, of his political career or his life uh, career and work. Um, and in addition to that, he was the uh, person that uh, that ended the practice of not letting women be pages in the Ontario legislature. So, you know, he is uh, is extraordinary from, from that perspective. And uh, back to the recruiter, um, there is an archive, uh, I think it's with Veterans Affair. I watched an archive on uh, the Mr. Brathway speaks about that issue. And uh, he said he said something to the, the effect of that they don't accept, you know, your kind here. And I think I th if memory serves me correct, I think he went back to speak to his father about it, and his father kept encouraging him to not give up. Hmm. Gwyn, I wonder if you could, you know, put it, put it in the time, put it into the times. Here's a black man from Toronto. In the 1950s, he graduates from not just U of T, not just Harvard, but Osgoode Hall as well. How unusual must that have been? Very unusual. Very unusual. <laughs> and again, uh, that just shows the incredible uh, fortitude, brilliance um, of Leonard Braithwaite. And, you know, again, I, I keep on saying that the Black community in Canada is one of the best kept secrets. And um, we have so much to contribute. Um, others have made, have been so instrumental, you know, in moving the, 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 the country forward. And, and I, I'm just hoping that at this time, 2022 that we start to realize how important it is that all communities, all, pe all people have an, act, uh, an opportunity to be their best self, to, to, to be able to make that contribution because as, as we see in a family, when all our children are doing okay, we become a very powerful, effective family. And so when we look at Canada as a family, we've got to start thinking about that. We've got to make sure that all communities, all people have an opportunity to soar. That is the only way we are going to really create the, the country that we know Canada is capable of. So mm -hmm. it's time, and I'm just imploring that everyone takes that opportunity, gives us that opportunity to be seen, to be included, and to be valued. David, I want to pick up with you. Now, I know you were just a kid when he was in politics, but, but I want to go through some of the numbers with you here because his political career was strange in as much as in 1963, he won his first election for the Liberals. 1963 was a massive majority government for the Conservatives. In fact, they got the highest percentage of the total votes in <laughs> post-war history. The Robarts government, it still stands to this day. It was a huge number. Then in 1975, when the Tories almost lose, he loses. Do you have any recollection of how down in the dumps he might have been after losing in 1975 when, you know, when the Tories were doing so badly, you'd figure he'd win that election? Well, again, my, my dad, he, he took everything in stride. I mean, you know, you win some, you lose some. And I'm sure he wasn't happy about losing the election, but, um, you know, everything, everything comes to an end. But uh, when, when the door closes, another one opens. So I didn't really uh, see him um, any differently than had he, had he won. Hmm. We seem to hear a portrait right now of a guy who was humble, of a guy who was centered. Um, but but um, in all of my pre-interviews with the four of you, and then again here during this discussion here, I'm not hearing any stories about a man who was bitter or angry about whatever discrimination he may have encountered during Toronto of the 1960s and 70s. I see a lot of head shaking right now. Gwyn, you want to pick up on that? Why would that be? Um, he, when I remember um, Leonard, he was a very positive individual. You see, um, when you know who you are, when you know what you're capable of doing, what you, when you know the essence of humanity in life, um, you know that there'll be people against you, but the idea is to keep focused, keep forward. And he was a visionary. Um, so he was one never ever to give up. I, I would say that the first thing that strikes you when you meet Leonard is that he was a very positive individual, always hopeful and always encouraging. 
So, you know, I, I have left feeling very empowered because I've had the opportunity to have him in my life. Let me ask his gods on the same question. Warren, any recollection of, of his being angered or bitter about the circumstances he found himself in? No, no recollection. But actually, my mother was telling me about uh, in the 50s when he was at U of T, you know, I think he was walking down University Avenue and he got stopped by the police, you know, asking him, what, you know, what's he doing there? Uh, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, has ha happens to this day. But, you know, he just took things in stride. He didn't. He made the choice not to let things get him down and uh, to, uh, you know, really uh, st keep on his on his path. So, uh, again, I never saw him complain. I never even saw him get angry, <laughs> you know, huh. in all the years that I knew. He's always very, I mean, I'm not sure if David can make reference, <laughs> other references, but uh, he was always very positive, you know, yeah. even keeled and, uh, you know, very supportive and uh, always, uh, you know, just had uh, nothing but uh, positive things t to say. You know, he was very supportive of, you know, um, my businesses and stuff. And he uh, said, well, you're my godson. I got, got to give you some, uh, you know, free legal advice. And actually, <laughs> uh, you know, I'd started a network called First Fridays. And uh, back in the 90s, and, and another group started one, uh, you know, shortly thereafter. And he gave me advice that uh, allowed me to prevail. And, uh, you know, so that continues on to this day. And, you know, thanks to his advice. David, I'm tempted to ask you. I mean, you were his son. You, you must have seen him get angry at some point. Probably at you for your behavior, but that's another story. Well, that, that's probably the only story I have. The worst, uh, back in the day, you know, when, you're, when your father says, um, make sure you're in your room when I get home from work. Um, uh, that's not a good day for you. So but he straightened out things um, uh, pretty quickly back in the day. Um, that was before child services, but um, you know they step in and all that. But anyways, joking aside, I'm I'm serious. I've um I've never really seen him get angry. It, it just wasn't part of his part of his DNA. And 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 you know worrying about you know spilt milk and all that sort of stuff isn't going to help anything. So he always took the path to go, you know, to, to move on and whatever obstacles that were in his way. And there were many. And it, it's not just my father. You uh, look at um, Warren's father, the late Dr. Uh, Douglas Salmon. They were like two peas in a pod. His father was the, was the medical version of my father. And education, especially um, uh, their parents uh, from... Uh, being from um, the West Indies, education was a, a big deal, in, mm. in quotation marks. Right. And um, that's that's how my father was able to uh, to do a lot of the stuff that he, he did uh, was because he had the education to to be not only I don't want to use this at the same level, but to be with the people that are making the decisions. If you want to make true change, you have to be with the people that are making the decisions. And um, he had no problem with that. Gotcha. Michael, I think it's well known that uh, Alvin Curling was the first black cabinet minister in Ontario history. Uh, Zanena Conde was the first black female cabinet minister in Ontario history. But you spent a decade at Queen's Park. How well do you think the Len Braithwaite story is known by people who work every day in the legislature? You know, unfortunately, I don't think the story is known as, as much as it should be. And, um, you know, he, he plays such an important role in the Canadian narrative. And um, when I got to the Ontario legislature, you walk around uh, the building, there's only about three or four items that relate back to the black community. You know, Mr. Curling's uh, portrait as a speaker, the second battalion plaque that's there, and there's an image uh, at the bottom of the legislature. But beyond that, there's no real... You know, there's nothing really there that symbolizes our accomplishment in this province that we've been part of since the very beginning of its uh, existence. You know, I would go as far to say, you know, today that there should be uh, either some type of, uh, you know, some type of uh, symbol symbolizing what he was able to do, you know, um, either a, a statue, a plaque, something symbolizing his story, uh, because it's one of the greatest stories told at Queen's Park and his legacy is not only important for the people on, on, on the show today, but I mean for next generation of Canadians to know 
that even when people push you down, when people have uh, pushed you aside and forgotten about you, you know, you can still perse persevere, you can still move forward, and you can still accomplish things. And he is the greatest example in the Ontario legislature, you know, along with, uh, of course, uh, people like uh, McPhail and other folks, uh, one of the greatest examples of people moving forward uh, to, uh, to change, uh, change the world. Gotcha. Sheldon, once again, if you would, let's bring up this next picture. Because if you go to Etobicoke, near Finch and Highway 27, anybody who wants to find themselves there on Monday, the next anniversary, the 10th anniversary of his death, that's Leonard Braithwaite Park. And you can go and remember this pioneer in Canadian political history. I'm not sure it's going to look that beautiful since there's probably still a bit of snow <laughs> on the ground. But, um, but think of Len, and that's a good place and a good day to do it. I want to thank all of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views and your uh, deep felt thoughts about Leonard Braithwaite, uh, Michael Coto, the MP, Warren Salmon, his godson, Gwyn Chapman, uh, anti-black racism advisor for Brampton, David Braithwaite, Len's son. Great having you all on TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.